for something completely different. Um, I'm going to make this presentation a little bit like I, I sing without any real notes, so, so bear with me. Um, so my name is Irvin Watkins. I'm going to talk to you today about uh, what I'm doing now, very briefly, which is running a company called Cool. I'll talk to you a little bit about that and how that's scaling up and the culture around that. But I really want to focus a bit more on attitude, um, return on luck, and social collisions. And how can you embed that in the DNA of an organization that's scaling fast in order to achieve success for the company and success for the individuals within it? I'm not here to give you the answers. This is a conversation with myself and a conversation with, uh, with a wider audience. Um, but let's start at the beginning. So I was born in a little village called Tenuted Wells. Now, Tenuted Wells is the craziest, maddest village probably in the UK, if not the world. So if you're not familiar with it, you may have heard of the World Bog Snorkeling Championship. You may have heard of the famous man versus horse race, where a runner races a horse and rider over 22 miles. Um, and they're now hosting the, uh, which is actually the largest horse race in the UK, 50 horses, which are capped for um, health and safety, and then about three, 400 runners. Um, and then this summer, they're doing the World Alternative Games, which involves um, spouse carrying, finger jousting, jelly wrestling, and egg Russian roulette. <laughs> so um, it's also the home of Sospen Vach. So Sospen Vach is a song sung passionately by Welshmen at uh, the Millennium Stadium about a big Sospen and a small Sospen. <laughs> yeah. I think the common thing around Shunted Wells is it's surrounded by magic mushrooms. <laughs> so that's where I'm from. And, uh, and I did shit at school really bad. I failed everything. Um, I, I, I did go for my A-levels only because my mum forced me to, and, uh, and I failed them. They got unclassified. So I was an August child, so I was 17. I sat down with a, with a careers advisor at school, and he said, well, Watkins, you've got, I think you have to do the four Fs for you based on your education. Farming, forces, forestry, or fuck off. <laughs> I said, I'll take the fourth one, sir, please. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, I, I left. <coughs> Just to go back a little bit, I was a teenager in 1977, year zero. Star Wars, Sex Pistols, everything, all attitude was formed after that. Punk only lasted a year. Everything happened after that. I formed a punk band at school called the Groovy Pineapples. We were dreadful. Um, but what it meant is that uh, my auntie could buy me uh, a guitar, and I was in a band two days later, and we were gigging four days later. It was fantastic. What I didn't realize then, that I was starting to form a few business ideas, tragic and terrible, but the concept of Groovy Pineapples was deeply flawed, and there's no reason why we, this is the reason we weren't successful. The idea was that the songs had to last three minutes, of course, because all good songs last three minutes. Um, you could never play the same song twice. You had to make the lyrics up as you went along, and you had to swap instruments in the middle of the songs, <laughs> even if you couldn't play. So it was dreadful, but it was a hell of a laugh. So um, on that basis, we moved up to London. As a group of us moved up, we ended up in a squat <coughs> in uh, Latimer Road in West London and started gigging, you know, very unsuccessfully. Uh, but it was absolutely hilarious. So I then thought, shit, we've got to do something serious in my life, really got to do something else. So I went to the park with my friends, cracked open a few beers. At this time, I was wearing a spark plug as an earring, and my hair was all over the place. Um, no idea why. It was never really that cool. So uh, my mate said to me, I bet you a fiver. If we go to the job center, you can't get a job that I point to on the wall. And I am an old man, 50 this year, so they did have job centers then with things on the wall and cards and stuff. It wasn't the internet. So I said, right, come on, let's go for it. So we went into the job center, and he pointed this card on the wall. It said, computer engineer wanted St. Paul, City of London. I went, bastard. Right. <laughs> OK, fair enough. So I took the card, as you did then, went down to the counter, and I said, could you give me an interview, please, for this, uh, for this job? And she looked me up and down, the receptionist. She said, are you sure? And I said, yeah, go on, give it a go. So she called up um, this company in St. Paul's, Cathedral Square, which doesn't exist anymore. and. Um, she got me the interview for the next day. So I thought, I've got to go through with this now. So I uh, 
I looked around in the squat. Of course, there's no suits there, so I knocked on the doors of the sort of uh, local squats next door. Which is, and they found like a demob suit, the best way to describe it. Flares, a little too small for me. Put a tie on, took the spark plug out. And I thought, I'm going to go for this. I'm going to go for this job. Because uh, the worst case scenario is he's got to pay me £2.50, not the fiver, because I'm not going to get the job. But, you know, might as well go for it. So we went, I went there, went for the interview. And there were four people there. They all had computer engineering degrees. It was great. So I went in. John Wales interviewed me. And he said, um, I don't have a CV or anything. Uh, I said, no, I don't, don't have one. Um, so tell me about your experience with computers. And I said, I've never seen one. <laughs> You know, I think they, we had one at school, apparently, but uh, that was, you know, the, you know, they kept dogs to keep people like me away from it, because it was closely guarded. The smart, the smart children saw the computer. Um, and I said, but I'm not that stupid, really, believe it or not, and I'm here for a bet. And my mate bet me a five or I couldn't get the job. And he went, mm -hmm. so, we, so we then, uh, the conversation went on a little bit, and he said, oh, I'll tell you what, I'll, uh, I'll call you tonight, let you know you got the job. I said, well... Bit tough. I live in a squat. There's no telephone or anything. And he's okay. Well, what's, where do you live? I said Latimer Road, Frinstead House, next to the tube station. Oh well, I'll, call, I'll knock on the door. Let you know tonight whether you got the job or not. So, yeah, right. so went back. You know, proud as punch to my mates, going, oh, "That was hilarious. You know, you've got to owe me two pound fifty for that. That was great." You know, got drunk. Knock on the door about eight o'clock at night. Guy turns up. John Wales. He said, "You got the job. You start on Monday." So that was my entrance into. Um, into computing. <laughs> and, uh, and as my mother still says, whenever she's asked about what, what does Irvon do now? Well, he's still in computing. <laughs> so I'm still in computing, apparently. But that's how I got my entrance into computing. Um, and, uh, and there's been a series of activities, you know, ever since then, really. So random, just random stuff. And the, uh, you know, the, the theme that sort of goes through life, really. So I, I, I was rubbish at engineering, you know, engineering. I mean, I was just turning a computer on, it doesn't work. And then that was it. That was the, the, the result of my engineering. And then I saw somebody in sales, and they were driving a nice car, and I thought, oh, can I do that? And they said, yeah, of course, yeah, your territory is EC4, that's your postcode, go and sell computers. Oh, that's fantastic. So off I went and did that. Um, and I did that for about two or three years. Uh, fairly successfully, I think I sold the first computer network ever in the city of London, um, and it connected one hard drive up to one printer and two PCs. <laughs> it's phenomenal. And there was a toggle switch you switched. I was proud as punch. <coughs> Genius. I then went to Spain for a week and, uh, and stayed for two years. Um, so gave that job up because it was rubbish anyway. So uh, I, I, I sort of did that. Um, and then I came back, started a business selling concrete um, and uh, that didn't work very well, I can guarantee you. I didn't know there were different types of concrete. I thought it was just concrete. <laughs> Ridiculous concept. So um, deep, deeply flawed plan, that was. Uh, and then I thought, oh, shit, I've got to work. I've got to earn some money doing something. So um, I called Dell up, and because uh, Dell had just started um, selling in the UK, I said, I'll give us a job. You know, I'm, pre I'm, I'm all right, really. And... Um, and then I, I, I became sales director of Dell. Um, <laughs> and one of the reasons I came that was because I, what I realized actually was I was quite good at building teams. Because one, I, was, I felt I was quite open, quite transparent, and very happy to share my weaknesses. I'm not into macho bullshit about, about you know, you know, how great I am. I'm frigging it out as you go along. And actually, it's been a theme of a lot of these discussions, is the fear, uncertainty, and, and figuring, figuring things out as you go along. So, where am I at now? I did okay, actually, with Dell. S shares were split in, really good. I then moved to a company based in Tampa in Florida, and they gave me some crazy job buying companies around Europe. I have no idea, but it was... Uh, it was uh, we, I bought six of them, anyway. Um, and then uh, I learned a lot, um, you know, and it, that was an interesting thing. So you buy six companies, and their mission was quite simple. I'll tell you what, go buy six companies around Europe for the revenues, and then we're going to float it on NASDAQ, and we're all going to be rich. <laughs> What's NASDAQ? Um, and, then, uh, and then they run out of money. And they said, you know those six companies you bought? They need to be profitable. Shit. Right. Um, I learned more in the hard times. You know, up to now, it had been 
series of random events that sort of take you on this sort of journey. And I'll talk about that in a second. Then you hit some shit times, and then you've got to knuckle down and you learn stuff. Nobody learns in good times. You learn through adversity. Um, so I learned a lot, a huge amount then. And I thought, well, actually, I want to do it myself again. So I set up a company called Cool. What Cool does is it builds algorithms, it's built algorithm that analyzes video content, understands what's within the video, and then offers up that content to advertisers globally to buy ads based on the content that it serves. I'd never been in advertising. I can't build an algorithm, and uh, I can't code. Um, I think that best things happen when you do not have domain expertise. Domain expertise is a restriction. Um, you're, you're full of fear of, and knowledge. Fear and knowledge together is, is deeply you know, inhibiting. Naive optimism. And uh, I think is a great way of, of disrupting. So I thought, well, no one's doing this. So I'll, I'll do that. Um, and that was in sort of 2008. And I spent six years getting it all wrong. I mean, what I was good at, though, was building a team. So we built a fantastic team. And the team stayed with me while I was screwing up. I had the wrong business model. I was getting too excited about the technology. I never bothered asking the customer what they wanted. <laughs> Um, uh, and we were just having too much fun, really, building stuff that no one cared about apart from us. Uh, I had some great investors that sort of backed me, which is, which is fantastic. Um, and they were right to, because right now we're probably the fastest growing tech, ad tech company in the world. So as of um, yesterday, sorry, as of last month, we were doing about 6 billion video views a month in 100 countries, 180 countries actually, delivering about 2 billion video ads. Uh, and our revenues are doubling month on month, and we're on that sort of hockey stick curve growth as a business right now. And that's based out of Bristol. We've got an office in, uh, in London. I bought a company in Santa Barbara in California, and we've got an office in New York. So the business is really sort of powering on. Um, so what the hell are you doing here, Avon? <laughs> you know, who should be too busy for that? You, you know, you know, I've heard all these stories about startup companies where you have to work 20 hours a day to get shit done. Bollocks, you don't. That's just macho bullshit, you know. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's a self-perpetuated myth of, uh, of idiots. And, um, <laughs> you know, I think as B.B. Uh, King said, the blues happen in between the notes. You need to have gaps, you know. And so we built a culture around the blues happen in between the notes. That's where the magic is. So how do you create a culture that actually that does that? So then that sort of got me thinking, and I read a book by Jim Collins, so this presentation owes a bit to Jim Collins, and it owes a lot to Tony Shea, from the founder of Zappos as well. My story is random, built on a series of lucky events. How can you maximize that return on luck? What do you have to do to invest in luck? Because, you know, I go back home to my mates, I went to school with them, because well, you're a lucky bastard, aren't you? I said, well, not really. I've had a few very unfortunate events in my life. Luck isn't good, is good luck, and luck is bad luck. So how do you actually get a return on that? Um, so I put a lot of thought into that and building that into the culture. What you need, I believe, and again, I'm taking this from Jim Collins, luck is an event. It isn't something that's random. And if you treat it as an event, you've got to know that it's actually happening, good or bad. You've then got to make a conscious decision. You've got to exercise your mind, I believe, to say, well, this is, this is a bit of luck that's landed on me. I haven't planned it. It's just sort of accident that's landed on me. Is this luck enough of an event for me to change my course? Or is this luck just a bit of luck that is just going to sort of take me a little bit of the journey? If it's a bit of luck that is enough to change your course, you've got to then follow that with furious passion and change your course. But to do that, you've got to be absolutely open to find the luck and recognize that it's there. And to do that, you need to have spaces and gaps. You need to attend events like the Do Lectures. You need to meet fantastic people, have open conversations. You need to have what Tony Shea calls social collisions. Social collisions create sparks, collisions create sparks. Sparks create energy. Energy creates conversations. Conversations create luck. And then you turn that luck into events, and then you do something about it. And then you apply 1977 um, attitude and you're the Ramones, you're the Pistols, and you've got that guitar, and you've never played it before, and you pick it up, and you go for it, because who cares? And you, um, but you don't have to work hard to have furious passion. Furious passion 
is absolute focus as far as I'm concerned, and then absolute de delegation. You know, so we've built a team. We haven't lost one member of our staff in the, it, since 2008. We have actually one who went traveling. Our team, 20% of our company we give to our employees. They have more holidays than, than, than you'd expect. Um, they all have to take their birthday off. We do not micromanage them. We have no middle managers. And, you know, they self-manage. And that means I can be here and the business is thriving. It means that everybody is passionate about what they do and culture is everything. I don't employ people based on their CV because I wouldn't have got a job based on my CV. So, um, you know, what, I'd be a hypocrite if I went down some CV. Talent can be found everywhere if given the opportunity to flower and shine. You know, life is about family, friends, quality of life. It's not about working 20 hours a day. You need the gaps in your life. You need the spaces. So we're, it's, an, it's a social experiment for cool. We're up to sort of 55 people. We'll probably have 85 by the end of the year and maybe 200 by the end of next year. Um, will that, you know, my, my absolute passion is to retain that culture. Um, my absolute passion is to enable the team that works for me, whether you're a junior member of staff, whether you're a senior developer, whatever that is, to have gaps in their lives, to have social collisions, to understand what events are, what lucky events are, and to work on it. That's, that, I think, is as, as important training as training in how to do a job. If you empower talented people, Life is just so chilled, it's unbelievable, you know, and my job is to get out of the way. So I think that you can, luck doesn't just happen, I think you can invest in it. I think you can invest in the processes that, 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 that sort of make you lucky. I think that also allows you to cope with the dark side of luck, because not all luck is good, of course, there's a lot of shit luck. But if you know it's an event, then you can treat it as an event and then deal with it and then sort of move on. Having talented people around you, having a process, um, I think is you know, deep, deeply important. Uh, so I'm in danger of rambling a little bit, which I sort of tend to do if I haven't got any notes. Um, and even with notes, I ramble. So my career advisor was brilliant. You know, taking the fourth F was really good for me. The random things that happened around since have been superb. And recognizing the luck that we all have in this room, we're deeply lucky just to be able to attend this. So what are we going to do with it? You know, do we leave and say, oh yeah, that was a great event, and yeah, it was great, it was great luck being there. Do something with it, do something with your luck, invest in your luck. If, it's, if the luck is a big enough event to change your life, go for it. Not at the expense of family and friends. Craig Gaps, BBB King. BB King, Sex Pistols, Star Wars. Come on, guys. You know, <laughs> life's good. So that's me. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>